Well, thank you, uh, Aaron and the AMC for having me. And a thank you to everyone who came out tonight to talk about nutrition with me. I am looking forward to spending the next hour talking all about nutrition and how you can use food to feel even better on your next hike. So um, go ahead and say hi in the chat and I will look at it later, but I would love to hear like what kind of backcountry adventures people are planning this year. So if you wanna drop those in the chat, I would, I would love to see it. Um, and I wanna start by sharing my goal for our time together this evening. And that is to leave you with some insights and tools that you can apply to your next hike and which are intended to help you enjoy your time outdoors even more than you already do, which I know that can be hard to imagine um, that that's even possible, but I think that it is because what I've found is that when I know exactly like how much food to take, um, what types of food to take to provide me with ample energy, and I'm no longer um, distracted by an excessively heavy pack or low energy or aches and pains, that my time outside becomes even better. And that's what I want for you guys listening tonight. And so that's what I'm gonna share about. So the material that we're covering over the next hour will provide you with an organized framework that you can use for snack and meal planning for future trips. And it'll help you have more consistent energy, faster recovery after a hard day of hiking, and it can help you pack the most weight efficient foods so that you can lower your pack weight. And for the most part, the information that I'm sharing is gonna be able to be applied to both day hikes as well as multi-night backpacking trips. So when it comes to trail nutrition, the two main questions I usually get are how much food do I pack and which types of food are best for hiking and backpacking, both from like a nutritional standpoint as well as from a weight efficiency standpoint. So that's what we're gonna cover this evening. We'll talk about how your dietary needs change when you're on trail. We'll talk about the simple process that I use to plan food, whether it's for a day hike or a multi-month backpacking trip. Uh, we'll talk about how to determine how much food to take, what types of food to take, and then how to eat for steady energy. And truly my plan is to give you the reasoning behind my suggestions, as well as some actionable tools that you can take away from our time together and implement on your next hike. And as Aaron mentioned, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So um, if you wanna hold your questions until then, or you can pop them in the chat and she's gonna um, feed them to me at the end. And I will also provide some resources at the end where you can go deeper on this topic if that's of interest of you or interest to you. So as Erin mentioned, um, before we go further, I will introduce myself so you know who you're learning from and why I'm so passionate about this topic. Um, as she mentioned, I'm a certified nutrition coach, author of the upcoming book, Adventure Ready, a hiker's guide to planning, training, and resilience. And I'm the creator of the Backpacker Academy online courses. I live in Colorado with my beloved kitty that we were talking about. And of course, I love to spend as much time outdoors as possible, as I know all of you do. And today I've covered around 10,000 backpacking miles on trails like the Pacific Crest Trail, uh, the Continental Divide Trail, the Colorado Trail, uh, Oregon Desert Trail, and a handful of others. I am an online instructor and a backpacking guide for Andrew Skirka Adventures. And through that work, I have had the absolute joy of helping hundreds of clients prepare for and go on their dream pack backpacking trips. And my deep dive into nutrition really started around 2014 after I finished the PCT and I found out I had an autoimmune condition that threatened to prevent me from being able to hike long days in the backcountry anymore, which is the thing I love to do most. And so this led me down the path of um, a lot of research and self-experimentation and getting my nutrition coaching certification so that I could basically keep my body healthy enough to get back outdoors. And thankfully, I've been able to do that. And I've been fortunate to hike thousands of miles since that time and to be able to share my love of the outdoors with other folks through um, coaching and courses and guiding. And I truly want anyone who desires to be able to do so to get outside and feel great no matter where they're starting from. So let's dive in. So how exactly can your nutrition affect your hike? Uh, one of the most powerful ways is by providing you with steady energy, both from the standpoint of eating sufficient calories, as well as um, from the standpoint of eating the right mix of macronutrients that support optimal energy. I think most of us have had that experience of um, like hitting the wall or crashing in the afternoon, having to drag ourselves into camp at night and nutrition can help you avoid that. Your food choices also impact your inflammation levels in your body for better or for worse. And chronic inflammation can cause things like 
increased fatigue, um, joint pain, brain fog, and more. And so we want to avoid, uh, avoid that as much as possible and use food to do that. Your nutrition can impact how well you recover after a hard day of hiking, meaning how sore you are the next day or whether your legs have some spring in them. I think we all know that feeling. And of course, this is especially important on a multi-day hike where you want to recover well and feel good day after day after day. And finally, being intentional and planning out your backpacking food can even help you lower your pack weight when you carry the right amount of food and the most weight efficient foods. And ultimately, when you have more energy and you're free of aches and pains and you're recovering faster and you're carrying a lighter pack, backpacking and your trip become a heck of a lot more fun. Essentially, backpacking is much less arduous when your pack is lighter and your body is feeling good. And good nutrition becomes even more important as we age and our bodies change. Many of my clients are in their 40s, 50s, and beyond, and they understand, rightfully so, that nutrition is one of the keys to staying active and continuing to adventure for years and years to come. So before we go any further into the material, I wanna cover just a few common terms so we're all on the same page. The first is calories, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Essentially, they're an indication of the amount of energy in food. There are a number of things that affect how calories are absorbed by the body, but we're gonna keep it straightforward and just think of calories as units of energy in food. And all of the calories that we eat, meaning all of the food that we consume, is made up of three macronutrients, and that's protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And each macronutrient plays a unique role in the body, and each is essential in a hiker's diet. And we'll get into that in a minute. So I would love for you to answer this question for yourself. When you're planning for planning food for your hikes and your backpacking trips, do you consider the increased demands that you're putting your body under and how you might use food to support your body's efforts? To know how to better support your body, it's helpful to understand how your dietary needs change on trail. So for example, your calorie needs increase. And this is the one that most people think about. Of course, you're expending more energy on trail and therefore you need to take more energy in. Your vitamin and mineral needs also increase. So vitamins and minerals are broken down faster when the body is under stress and heavy physical exercise like backpacking is a stressor to the body. So when you're exercising a lot, your need for nutrients goes up. Your protein needs increase. Uh, protein supports muscle repair and resynthesis and helps build a healthy immune system. And when you're exercising a lot, muscle is broken down more rapidly so to adequately repair muscles, you need to consume adequate protein. And I find that protein is something that many hikers overlook. So it's something I like to emphasize. And lastly, your carbohydrate and fat needs may shift from what they are at home. It's important to understand that um, almost all of your muscular energy comes from either carbohydrates or fat. And what determines whether your body prefers carbs or fat depends on the length and the intensity of exercise. So at higher intensities, the body relies more on carbohydrates and at lower intensities, it relies more on fat. Therefore, during uh, low to moderate intensity activities, which for the most part is what backpacking is, fat can be a great fuel source for the body. So it's helpful to know this because you can adjust your macronutrients of your food bag based on the expected effort of your hike. So if you have an intense effort, such as summiting a mountain, you may wanna include more carbohydrates for more of that explosive energy. Whereas if you know your effort will be on the easier side, you can rely more on fats so that you can keep your pack weight lower. I wanna emphasize that food planning for a day hike or even a multi-month hike does not need to be overwhelming. You just need a simple framework for how to think about it. And that's what I'm gonna share with you guys this evening. Um, it's my experience that a little bit of planning does go a long way. So it allows you to ensure that you're carrying enough food so that you don't go hungry, which of course is no fun, but also that you're not carrying way too much, which tends to be the more common occurrence. And while carrying uh, a little bit of extra food not, might not seem like a big deal, it does become more problematic the longer you're out because you're carrying that extra weight on your back the whole time. So if you imagine how many footsteps you take on a backpacking trip and each footstep with extra weight on your back is not only more difficult, especially if you're climbing and descending mountains, but it also causes extra wear and tear in the body, which can then of course lead to injury if you're on a long trip. So when you take the time to plan, you also can ensure that you're carrying a proper mix of macronutrients that's gonna support optimal energy and faster recovery. 
So the method that I use to plan food for my hikes, whether it's a day hike or a through hike, looks like this. I determine how much food I need for the chosen trip. I choose the appropriate types of food. And by that, I mean that they fit the criteria that I'm going to go over in the next few slides. And then I use this information to create a backcountry meal plan if I'm going to be out for multiple nights. And then I enjoy my hike with abundant energy and a lighter pack. So on a day hike, of course, the planning is going to be much simpler, um, but these principles really still apply. Even on a day hike, I'm thinking about how many hours I'm going to be out and how much energy that's going to require and the types of food that are best going to fuel me. Uh, so we'll look at each step in more detail. So how much food do I pack? This is a really common question. And it's common for backpackers, even experienced ones with thousands of miles on their feet to overestimate their needs and end up carrying way too much. Um, so we pack our fears, as they say, and many people fear going hungry. So overpacking or underpacking can happen when you guess at your needs or follow a blanket recommendation, such as like the two pounds per day rule or a range of calories, such as like 2,000 to 3,000 calories per day rather than doing a few calculations to determine your individual needs and then experimenting and sort of re refining from there. So one weakness of a blanket recommendation such as a broad calorie range is that it's going to be less accurate if you are on either end of average. Uh, for example, a 110 pound woman is going to need far fewer calories than like a 210 pound man, right? So my recommendation is to determine your food needs by estimating your unique caloric expenditure and packing your food calories accordingly. So if you're unsure of how many calories your body uses during a day of hiking, the simplest way to get started is to use a free basal metabolic rate calculator to estimate your needs and then adjust for your activity levels. And you can find one of these calculators for free on the internet if you search for BMR calculator. And I would look for one that allows you to adjust for activity, which most of them do, um, so that you can determine caloric expenditure for a full day of hiking. And then once you have that baseline number, keep in mind that there are additional factors that can affect daily calorie requirements, including pack weight, um, intensity of the trip, duration, the terrain that you're going over, weather, um, temperature, and altitude. So for example, if you are on a trip where you're averaging like 4,000 feet of elevation gain per day and a large percentage of your miles are off trail, you're going to require more calories than if you're averaging 1,500 calories feet, uh, feet of elevation gain per day on well-groomed trails. Or carrying a, heavy, carrying a heavier pack requires more calories as does hiking in like cold, wet weather where the body needs to generate more heat to keep itself warm. And so when you're using these calculators to determine how much food to pack, keep in mind that these numbers are just estimates and they're intended to give you a starting point from which to start refining uh, how much food you need per day. Ultimately, the best way to learn how much food your particular body uses is by testing out this formula and gaining experience. And if you follow the formula and it leaves you hungry, you'll know to pack a bit more next time. And similarly, if you use this approach and it leaves you, um, if you have way too much food left over, you'll know that you can reduce the amount of food on future trips if all other conditions are gonna be the same. And if you like to pack extra food in case of emergency on a multi-night uh, hike, I completely understand that. I think packing an extra meal or a few extra snacks is a great idea in case you're gonna get delayed because um, you never know what might happen. But that said, what's not necessary is packing like an extra few days worth of food, which could be several extra pounds on your back. The way I think about it is like this. If I'm going to spend hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars on lightweight gear, um, it doesn't make sense for me to carry several pounds too much food on my back. So I try to give my food the same level of attention that I do any other part of my backpacking kit. So essentially understanding your food needs becomes more important the longer you're out. So your body can deal with a deficit or an excess um, on a shorter trip, such as a day hike or an overnight trip. But if you're chronically overpacking on a longer trip, again, you're carrying that excess weight. And if you're chronically underpacking, you're really shortchanging your um, health and your performance because um, that in that deficit, you'll find that your energy goes down more, your immune system is weaker, and you might start to actually experience muscle loss if your body is eating away at itself because you don't have sufficient calories. So now that you guys know how much, uh, how to determine how much food to pack, how do you decide what types of food to pack? So when it comes to choosing what types of food to take with me, I filter options through these five criteria. 
I look for foods that are energy dense, nutritious, packable, appealing, and simple. So because backpackers have to carry everything on their back, trail food needs to be energy dense, meaning that it has high calorie per ounce. Most hikers aim for greater than 125 calories per ounce or at least 100 calories per ounce. So for the most part, this means fresh items like fruits and veggies with their high water content and low calorie dense density are not um, ideal choices to make up the bulk of your food. Personally, I'll pack out a few fresh items like carrots or an avocado for satisfaction and nutrition on the first day or two uh, of a trip out from town, but fresh produce, produce doesn't make up the bulk of my trail diet. To achieve high calorie density, the easiest way to do that is to prioritize healthy fats because fat contains nine calories per ounce, um, while carbohydrates and protein are each four calories per gram. I'm sorry, I said nine calories per ounce, I meant nine calories per gram. Carbs and protein are four calories per gram. So this means you can carry the same amount of calories for less food weight if you prioritize fat than you can if you are carrying predominantly carbohydrates or protein. So the, the calorie density of different macronutrients is why packing food um, based on weight, such as two pounds per day, is less than ideal and is not as accurate um, than if you were using calories um, because the calorie content of two pounds of food could vary significantly depending on whether you're packing primarily fat or um, primarily uh, like protein and or carbs. Of course, no one is packing like all sticks of butter or only honey buns, I hope. Um, most people are naturally carrying a mix of macronutrients, but hopefully understanding this concept of calorie density um, and the different calorie density of different macronutrients helps you understand why using calories to determine how much food to pack is more accurate than using like the weight of your food bag. So the takeaway is that the macronutrient makeup of your food choices affects your pack weight and high fat foods are gonna be more calorically dense. So when you're prioritizing fat in your backpacking diet, I wanna note that it's important to be thoughtful about what type of fat you're prioritizing. So whole food sources of fat, such as nuts or seeds or olive oil, are preferable to more inflammatory industrial seed oils like canola oil or safflower oil. And um, trans fats or excessive saturated fat uh, should also be avoided. So on this slide, I wanted to illustrate the impact on pack weight of prioritizing calorie dense foods by showing the weight difference of a five-day resupply at 4,000 calories per day at different calorie densities. So you can see on here, if your food averages 100, cal 100 calories per ounce, um, this resupply would weigh 12.5 pounds. If you average 125 calories per ounce, it would weigh 10 pounds, and at 150 calories per ounce, it would weigh 8.3 pounds. So essentially, you could reduce the weight of your food bag and therefore your backpack um, by over four pounds, if you're packing foods that are averaging 150 calories per ounce versus foods that are 100 calories per ounce. So all of this is not to, is, is not to say that carbs or protein aren't an essential part of a hiker's diet. They definitely are. Carbs are a critical source of energy, especially for more intense efforts. They're also essential for cognitive function and restoring glycogen at the end of the day. And protein is necessary for preventing muscle loss and repairing muscle. It's also important for um, the immune, uh, immune system to have function properly and for the formation of red blood cells and mitochondria, which helps with energy metabolism. But speaking strictly in terms of energy density, fats are truly the king. So when thinking about what macronutrient ratios to pack in your food, ba food bag, once you ensure that you have adequate protein, Prioritizing healthy fat can be a great way to keep your pack weight lower and to fuel that low to moderate intensity effort, as I was speaking about earlier. So I will go over examples of healthy high fat foods in just a moment. Um, but first, let's talk about the second principle. Um, the second thing that I look at when evaluating trail food is whether it's nutritious. And in this case, I'm using the word nutritious to mean that it promotes steady energy and that it's anti-inflammatory. So trail food can promote steady energy by containing a mix of macronutrients that support blood sugar balance either within one food or when combined. And this can be accomplished by eating fat and or protein alongside whole food sources of carbohydrate for each meal and snack. So it's not uncommon for backpackers to rely on heavily processed carbs such as candy or cookies thinking that that sugar is gonna like give them a spike of energy or a boost of energy 
And while simple sugars do provide a burst of energy, it's then followed by that um, infamous energy crash. And then you're going to have cravings for more sugar. And then you're going to be on this energy roller coaster all day long. And usually that leaves you feeling awful and just tired. Um, so to be clear, blood sugar levels naturally vary throughout the day. Um, but by avoiding large fluctuations, we can avoid big energy swings by including some fat and or protein with each meal and snack, which provides more of that like lasting steady energy that keeps us going all day. In addition to looking for foods that help me support and balance my blood sugar, I also seek out options that actively combat inflammation rather than contributing to it. So inflammation is a word that is common nowadays. It's usually referred to in a negative sense and it certainly can be, but it's important to understand that it's actually an essential part of your immune system that's activated when your body is under threat. And the problem occurs when that inflammatory response gets stuck in like the on position and the inflammation becomes chronic. And this leads to issues such as fatigue and joint pain, um, digestive distress, hormone imbalances, and more. And it happens through repeated exposure to threats to the body, including certain foods like trans fats or excess, excess sugar, highly processed foods, and artificial ingredients. So I try to keep in mind that everything I'm eating is either fighting inflammation or contributing to it. So I aim to give my body um, a boost and support it by choosing anti-inflammatory foods on trail. And again, I'm gonna talk about some examples in just a second because you're probably thinking, okay, this is great, Katie, but how do I actually apply this um, when I'm packing my food bag? So in the next slide, we're gonna look at examples of um, anti-inflammatory whole food options from each macronutrient category. So that's what you can see here. Um, and this should, seeing some of these examples is intended to help with meal and snack planning. So if you're thinking, okay, how do I increase healthy fats if that's going to help me lower my pack weight? Um, what are some examples of how to do that? So you can see up there like olive oil and coconut oil, um, nuts, seeds, coconut is always a good source. Dark chocolate is one of my favorites. Um, maybe you're thinking, all right, what are examples of some nutrient dense carbohydrates I can eat rather than relying on candy for quick hits of energy. So you can see down there some more like whole food sources of carbohydrates, like fruits. Um, I think like sweet potato chips are one of my favorites. Um, any kind of like dehydrated veggies, rice noodles, things like that. What are some good sources of protein that can help repair muscle at night? And so you can see some sources of protein there, whether it's um, grass-fed jerky or um, soy products, if you don't eat meat, um, looking for that healthy protein is definitely important. So when you're thinking about creating that blood sugar balanced meal that I was just talking about for steady energy, you can think about which choices you could combine from each of these categories so that you're creating meals that have fat, protein, and carbs in each meal or snack. So for example, maybe you're putting together a dinner and you might choose um, dehydrated chicken as your protein, instant rice as your carbohydrate, and a packet of olive oil as your fat. And I would also add some spices for both flavor and their antioxidant value. Or maybe you're choosing food for a trail lunch. So you might choose a tuna packet as your protein, um, avocado oil-based mayo as your fat, and then throw some crushed chips in there as your carbohydrate. So I might be uh, revealing my hiker trash ways with that suggestion, but the take home is that you can create any combination you want based on whatever you like. And then for breakfast, I usually have a trail smoothie that I make that includes collagen powder as the protein, coconut milk um, powder as the fat, a greens powder for a little bit of carbohydrate, and then several other anti-inflammatory spices and superfood ingredients that support endurance. And if you're curious about that, the recipe is on my website if you search um, energy booster trail smoothie. <clears throat> So the next criterion I look for is packable. So backpacking food must be compact and on a multi-night trip remain edible for days without refrigeration. It must, must withstand being squished in a food bag. And um, if it's in the middle of the pack, so you, know, you don't want to get squished and cause a mess and packaging should be minimal, light and compact since you need to pack everything out. And this means things like um, cans of beans or of course glass jars, uh, like things like nut butter, um, condiments that are in thick plastic bottles don't meet this criteria. Things that do work are things like um, single serve condiments like olive oil or those little packets of nut butter, um, pouches of tuna, 
nuts or dried fruit that you've repackaged into Ziplocs, um, dehydrated and freeze dried items. Those are just a few examples of things that are very packable um, and withstand being compacted. They're non-perishable and you can like squish them in the center of a pack. And, <clears throat> and in terms of being packable, I also think about the packaging. And before I head out on any trip, I remove as much packaging as possible, um, such as any uh, boxes, excess plastic, um, even the freshness seal if I'm taking a plastic jar of nut butter, which I often do. And that may seem crazy and over the top, but I really do try to avoid bringing any excess trash into the backcountry. Um, not so much because of like the weight of it, but because that's just one more item that could get left out there. If you've seen micro trash, like um, the corners of bar wrapper sitting on the side of the trail, uh, you know what I'm talking about, which if you've been on trail, you've probably seen that. And the next thing I look for is appealing. It's truly a miserable feeling to reach the top of a strenuous climb, feeling famished, only to open your food bag to a, you know, a food bag full of unappetizing food. Uh, has, has anyone had this experience? Because I definitely have, and it's no fun. So just like with the food that you eat at home, there's no reason that the food you eat on trail um, shouldn't be delicious. So by carrying a variety of textures and flavors, you can ensure that you'll be excited every time you open your food bag for a snack. So some examples of different textures and flavors include salty, such as chips or jerky or savory dinner dishes like um, noodles or beans. Um, some examples of sour, such as like vinegar flavored chips or mustard. Um, sweet, such as dried fruit, um, which is what most bars um, are on the sweeter side or chocolate. Crunchy, again, chips and crackers come to mind or um, roasted nuts maybe. And then there's soft and chewy, such as like fruit leather or um, cheese or beans or oatmeal. <clears throat> and I'd also encourage you to test food ahead of time to ensure that you like it. So just because you, I don't know, find a box of energy bars on sale at the health food store, um, it doesn't mean that you should buy 15 of them and take them on your next five night backpacking trip before you even test them out for a day hike because you wanna ensure that A, that you like them, and also they agree with your stomach and they don't give you any sort of like digestive distress. And then the last criterion I look for in trail food is that it's simple. So simple to acquire and simple to prepare. So there are so many logistics to consider pre-hike that finding a way to make healthy ultralight eating easy is a priority for me. So I prefer to create meals from ingredients that can be found in most grocery stores or purchased in bulk and easily assembled at home. And I prefer meals that can be prepared by simply adding boiling water or by cold soaking them. This keeps it very easy. So this criterion is of course a, a personal preference. If you love to make elaborate meals in the backcountry, then like by all means do so and enjoy yourself. Um, personally, I like to keep things simple so that I can reduce preparation time both um, at home as well as in the field. Um, so if you use any of the recipes on my website, you'll notice that they fit this description. Like they're, they're very straightforward and simple. Um, so to recap, the way that I think through what types of food to pack is to filter them through the following criteria, energy dense, nutritious, packable, appealing, and simple. And so that's how I sort of like think through and evaluate foods as if I'm deciding whether they go in my pack or not. So we have covered um, how to know how much food to pack and how to know what types of food to take. And you can then use this information to create a meal plan for a multi-night backpacking trip. So you could write this out by hand, but I find that spreadsheets are very helpful for this process because they do a lot of the math for you. So I will show you an example on the next slide, but essentially to create a meal plan, I take into account my estimated daily energy expenditure, which was the first thing we talked about um, the macronutrient nutrient goals that I have for this trip, which we touched on. And I just add foods and meals to the spreadsheet until I hit those targets. And I use this spreadsheet to then determine the quantities of each food or ingredient that I need for my meal plan. And I use that as my shopping list. And then once I've purchased all of my snacks or ingredients, I create my meals and repackage everything for the trail. 
And again, this, this method can be applied whether you plan to take um, commercial freeze-dried meals or whether you make your own meals at home. My preferred method is to purchase um, freeze-dried and dehydrated ingredients in bulk and then to assemble the meals at home myself. So for me, this saves time over dehydrating my own meals and it allows me to determine exactly what goes into my meals. But again, if you love to dehydrate your own meals, that's wonderful and keep doing what you love. And here is a sample meal planning spreadsheet, which I pulled from my uh, performance nutrition for backpackers course. And your spreadsheet need not be this detailed if this feels overwhelming to you. So I wanna mention there are two ways you could think about meal, um, meal planning and like creating a, a spreadsheet like this, um, either going by the day and planning out each breakfast, lunch, and dinner for each day, or thinking of it as the trip as a whole. So on a long hike, and because I tend to eat a lot of the same things from day to day, I usually make my spreadsheets by looking at a whole five-day trip at once um, and filling in like, okay, I know I'm going to need five breakfasts, um, like 15 snacks that I can eat three each day, uh, whatever, five lunches. Um, and I do it as like the whole thing because a lot of, again, a lot of my meals and snacks are the same. And I do that rather than going day, day by day. But either way, um, the information included and the process is the same. This, this spreadsheet I'm showing here happens to be broken down by the day, but I just want to mention you could either do it this way or you could just like, if you're doing a multi-month trip, um, you could just do it like by the resupply box. So you can see on this spreadsheet that I have my trip location up in the top left corner. So um, I don't have it filled in, but say I'm planning a five-day trip in the San Juans. And then I would fill in my calorie goal. So I would know that from doing that, um, the calculations I mentioned earlier and or knowing from prior experience. So say I plan to eat 3000 calories per day. And then I will just add um, meals and snacks into the spreadsheet until I'm at uh, 30, say 3000 or 3300 calories per day. I'll usually go a little bit over um, or I'm sorry, for the whole, yeah, per day, or like 15 to 16,000 for the whole trip, if I were doing it by the trip. And then I'll also note my macronutrient range, um, macronutrient targets that I'm going for, such as, um, say I know that I wanna hit like 20% protein, 50% fat, and 30% carb, because I've tested this out and decided that that's how my body feels best. Um, and I will, I have an area on my spreadsheet that calculates that for me as well. And I usually, um, you, again, you could go by the day or you could go by the whole box and just trust that things are going to like shake out properly by the day. So um, again, this is, you could write this out by hand and keep it simple, um, such as like just what you plan to eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snack, and just be sure that you're going to hit your target calorie goal, or at least get in that, that range and that you're including a mix of macronutrients. It doesn't need to be as in-depth as this, or if you love spreadsheets um, and planning, it can be. So to recap the what we have covered, we talked about how your dietary needs change on trail. Um, and to summarize, you need an increase in calories, um, increased nutrients, and increased protein, and then kind of thinking about how your fat and carbohydrates might shift. We talked about how to decide how much food to take so you can um, figure out your daily calorie expenditure through one of those online calculators and or um, test it out through experience, or maybe you know from experience. We talked about how to decide on what types of food to eat. Um, the criteria that I use are that it's calorie dense, nutritious, appealing, packable, and simple. And we talked about how to combine all of this into a backcountry meal plan. Oh, and we talked about how to eat for steady energy, which is to include fat and or protein um, with your meals and snacks for balancing your blood sugar. And so before we get into the Q&A portion, I just wanted to share a few resources where you can go deeper on this topic. Um, the first is my website, which has um, five or six years worth of blog posts, including information on how I've applied all of this information. And then as I mentioned, I also have an online course um, called Performance Nutrition and Meal Planning for Backpackers. This goes much deeper into what we covered today and walks you step-by-step step through figuring out your food intake, your macronutrients, um, purchasing food, putting together a meal plan um, or a resupply strategy, and also covers like recovery, hydration, electrolyte supplements, 
um, much more than we could get into this evening um, and include spreadsheets and templates and all that sort of thing. And you can find that at katiegerber.teachable.com. And I wanted to offer you guys a discount for attending tonight. So um, you can use that code AMC15 for 15% off until the end of the month. Um, and if you really wanna go deep on this sort of information, I also offer private coaching if you have specific health goals and you want one-on-one -on -one mentorship and uh, reaching them faster. And you can just um, reach out to me on my website or um, on my email at katie at katiegerber.com. And I just wanna thank you guys for your attention this evening. I hope this provided you with some actionable tools to implement on your next hike so that you can get outside feeling even more amazing and keep adventuring for years to come. And so I will stop screen sharing and we can open up for questions. Thank you, Katie. That was really great. Oh, um, good. You're welcome. <laughs> very informative. Um, people put lots of uh, trips. I don't know if you're looking at the chat Actually, at all, but <laughs> yeah, let me open it up here. There's people put lots oh. of their plans, which is kind of cool. Oh, that makes me so happy. Oh, lots yeah. of fun stuff. Awesome. Yeah. I got a question uh, that someone sent directly to me that says, um, nuts have great fats, but aren't they hard to digest, thus not getting into the bloodstream when needed? Mm, that is a great question. So um, a couple of things. So fats definitely are slower to digest. Yep. So if you're looking for like a quick hit of energy, um, relying more on carbohydrates. So the carbohydrates, especially simple carbohydrates are going to digest the fastest and provide like the quickest hit of energy, complex carbs, like the curve is, um, they release a little bit uh, later and then they kind of like, um, cut off after, or they're sort of like used up after around two hours and then protein and then fats. So that is sort of the order of digestion. So that's why protein and fats provide the lasting energy. So if you want a quick energy, um, yes, nuts are harder to digest. So you wouldn't get that like quick burst of energy. Um, so that's something I'll mention about nuts. The other thing, if you wanna make them easier to digest is you can actually get um, sprouted or soaked nuts, which are a little bit easier. They've, um, yeah, they've been soaked overnight and they're a little bit easier to digest. So that's a, a thought for that as well. Great. Um, someone says, uh, what is your advice for someone on a low carb diet? Yeah, this um actually backpacking food and the, the way that I look at it is actually really can, could be really conducive to a low carb diet be, because of what I was sharing about how prioritizing fat and fat being a great, both great for lowering your pack weight because it's like the most weight efficient way to pack food, as well as fat being um, the body's preferred fuel source for low to moderate efforts. I actually think backpacking on a low carb diet is... Um, it, it, they fit together well, is how I'll say it. So um, I'm not sure if was the question asking about like ideas for it, or just if it's um, like a good idea. <laughs> I think I uh, let's see. I've got to go back now here. Oh, sorry. The questions are starting to come. Yeah, up I, here. Advice for someone on a low carb diet. Advice. Like, yeah. Focus on fats and. Yeah, like, focus on those fats. I think you're you'll find that you'll probably need a little bit like if you're keto at home and you're, or low carb at home, you'll probably need a little bit more carbs on trail because your body is um you're going to be pushing yourself a bit more and you're going to be um yeah, wanting to exert yourself a bit more so your body will want a little bit more carbohydrate than at home, but it's totally possible. Um I would just focus on those healthy sources of fat like nuts and olive oil and um coconut oil powder and um, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, do you have any eco-friendly reusable products that you like to use? I get sick of discarding all my Ziploc bags and single use packets. Yes. Um, I don't know any of the brand names, but there are definitely, I, I totally feel that. And there, um, there are options for those like reusable plastic baggies that people use. And I mean, this is, Something that I do as well is I will use my bags until they're like disintegrating. So I will just like reuse and reuse and reuse. So I think that's helpful as well. And then you don't go through quite as much. Same thing with like plastic water bottles. So you'll see a lot of long distance hikers with like the smart water bottles. And um, this might be disgusting, but I usually carry them for like hundreds of miles. And I'll just like rinse them out in town like with um, hot soapy water and get them cleaned out, but carry them. But yeah, I definitely can understand that concern because it's, it's a lot of plastic use. Yeah, yeah, I reuse the the Ziplocs too. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. Hi, Katie. Thank you for your time. Do you have any suggestion for hikers who are looking for foods with low glycemic index, but high nutrient density beyond mm. nuts? Mm -hmm. um, for low glycemic index, you know, focusing on your fats and proteins are going to be um, most helpful for you. And then like low, say, low glycemic fruits, like berries, um, would probably be the way to go. So something that's going to have glycemic index is going to be affected by um, how quickly it's digested. So if it has more fiber in it, so if you're looking for maybe like dried fruits, that's going to be lower glycemic index than something like a cracker that's just going to like spike your blood sugar. So I would look for things that like looking at whole food options, basically it's like dehydrated um, veggies. Um, I'm not sure what the glycemic index of beans, but I can imagine it's not as, as high as some things because of the amount of fiber in beans. So that's where I would start kind of to summarize that like word salad, um, looking for fiber and looking for like whole food sources and sort of prioritizing fat and protein. Okay, great. Um, do you have <clears throat> suggestions for snacks in the winter time, things that don't freeze easily? Oh, that's a good one. Um, you know, there was a bar of brand that I wrote, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. A brand of bar that I really loved, um, called four points that was made of prunes that didn't freeze. And it was like my favorite winter bar, but they no longer, um, make them, but I would say, you know, things from that list again, like nuts, um, seeds, nut butters, like things that are made of powders, like noodles that you're going to um, boil or something like that. I think the freezing, like, I think the biggest problem that comes to mind for me is like bars that get so hard that you can't bite them. But other than just like testing ones out to find the ones that, that are not going to break your teeth. Um, I don't have any other good advice for that. Yeah. Well, cookies are great out of the freezer, actually. They I, I, yes, I agree. <laughs> I mean, things with flour in them soften up pretty quick, but <laughs> yeah, true. Um, do you have any suggestions for diabetics? Mm, I've worked with a couple of diabetics. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll say ultimately, like, you know, your body best and this goes for everybody, like, you know, your body and what works for your body best. But what I will say, like, as someone um, with an autoimmune condition, what I did was figured out what worked best for me at home and then ways to make that into trail food. So I thought like, I usually, I often in the summers will have smoothies at home. And so that's where my trail smoothie came from was like, how can I combine, um, fat and protein and carbs in a way that makes me feel good, but, a, a powdered version of it basically. So, um, while that's not like strictly advice for diabetics, um, I would say thinking, thinking about it in the way of like, what works best for you at home? And is there an equivalent in trail food? Like I would try to eat as similar as you could, um, on the trail because you know that that supports your body. All right. What are your favorite cold soak main meals? Oh yeah. Um, I think it's still on my website, but I had a short little ebook that was all about, um, cold soaking. It had, had, um, a handful of my favorite meals. I can check if it's still there, but on the freebies tab on my website, I think that it is, but, um, so I'll say for breakfast, um, doing overnight oats is one of my favorites. So I'll do cold soaked oats and then I'll add a ton of things to it, like, um, chia seeds and walnuts and sometimes like a dehydrated berries of some sort. So some version of overnight oats with whatever you like in there, like coconut flakes, or mm, you could mix nut butter into it or, or protein powder even. Um, I think that, so that's like my favorite cold soaked breakfast or, um, a soaked granola with protein powder as like the milk can be good but that could get mushy. So depends how you feel about textures. Um, <laughs> and then for dinners, my favorite, what I ate all along the PCT was, um, I would cold soak black beans and kale and I would mix in olive oil and then I'd let that soak for a couple hours. And I would add like crushed up chips to it. Um, mm -hmm. dehydrated hummus was a favorite one in cold soak, like any kind of noodles, like rice noodles or, um, wheat, ramen, something like that. Um, yeah, I would say those are some of my favorites. Okay. I know people that cold soak couscous. Um, I don't eat wheat, but that's an option for people who do. Okay. So yeah. some of that's overnight soaking and then some's just a couple of hours. Correct. Yeah. So for my breakfast, I would um, soak it after. So I would eat dinner and then like 
so that you have a cold soak jar and then I would like put the oats in it, soak it overnight. So it was ready to eat first thing in the morning, but most things only take like an hour to um, rehydrate. So for my dinners, I would just stop somewhere mid afternoon, put my dinner in, put the water in and then hike for another hour or two so that then my dinner was ready to eat once I got to camp. Okay, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, what should, uh, I avoid to be anti-inflammatory? Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, I would think of it more through the lens of like, what should I prioritize? Um, so I would prioritize to keep it very simple, like whole foods and things that are nutrient dense. So when you think of nutrient density, it's going to be like, um, yeah, like whole foods, like beans and nuts and seeds and dehydrated fruits and veggies in terms of what to avoid, um, food wise, like alcohol, excessive sugar, um, trans fats, um, a lot of like artificial ingredients, like colorings and, um, binders and stabilizers. Some of those can be inflammatory and to go a step deeper, um, each person might have different food triggers. So for instance, um, if you know, if you've noticed like that you react to dairy or to gluten or something like that, like you get stuffed up when you have dairy, that's an, probably an inflammatory food for you. So if you want to be anti-inflammatory, I would try to avoid that as much as possible. And then if you're looking at inflammation from like a lifestyle perspective, that's kind of a whole other conversation, but like, um, excessive sitting, not sleeping enough, smoking, um, stress can even be inflammatory. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, someone asked, uh, where do you find coconut milk powder? And somebody answered Amazon. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if that would be yeah. or yeah, the one that I get is from Amazon. I think it's called, I'm trying to think of the brand. I think it's called like micronutrients is the brand. I think, um, I do have actually a favorite products tab on my website and I'll make sure that it's on there. So if people want to see the one that I use, um, but essentially I'm looking for ones that were like coconut is the only ingredient. And that's kind of generally when I'm looking at foods, I'm looking for like as few of ingredients um, as possible and ones that I can pronounce. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. One of the things I've seen more in the mountaineering world is training to increase the amount of fat burning versus carb burning by activities such as fasted workouts. Have you seen something similar in the hiking world for training activities to shift metabolism? Yeah, I haven't seen that. I'm familiar with what they're talking about. Um, I haven't seen that in the hiking world very much, it's the, especially like the long distance hiking world. I feel like I don't know that that's just missing. Um, I have seen it in like the long distance running world, as well as in the mountaineering world. Um, the book uphill athlete, uh, it speaks to that quite a bit. This like exactly what they're saying, like fasted training to um, help you become a better fat burner basically. Um, mm -hmm. so that there is like a fair bit of research behind that, but I haven't seen it trickle into the backpacking world yet for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let's see any tips at shopping. Uh, for shopping at small markets in trail towns, markets such as gas stations, Dollar General, and convenience stores. Yes, yes. I totally have tips for this. Um, on my Oregon desert trail hike, the only towns that existed were those like tiny, tiny towns where like the post office is also the grocery store, is also the gas station, is also, it's like it's one place and it's just very small. So um, if this person wants to, to see my full process for how I think through this, I have a blog post called um, something like building a healthy resupply in a tiny C store or a tiny town. Um, so if you just like search for resupply in my blogs, but I go through this process. Um, but essentially how I approach this is I will look for, um, so I start with my proteins and then I look for those and whether that's like jerky or tuna packets, usually you can find at least something and I'm looking for like the most whole food options that I can. So maybe that's a, a trail mix. Like most gas stations have a trail mix. And then I look for the ones that has the, the, the mix that has like mostly nuts instead of mostly um, like M&Ms or something. Um, and then I'll look for dried fruit, which a lot of um, C stores have or convenience stores. Um, yeah, essentially I'm looking for like the most whole food options that can fit into um, like the macronutrient range that I'm looking for. And then I do a quick add, add up of like my calories to make sure that I'm getting in the right range. 
Um, but again, if that person wants to go deeper, I do have a, a blog post that outlines how I do that because that's definitely a problem in some of those tiny towns. The selection can be pretty limited. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see, uh, I had a question. Um, sure. I, 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 a couple of things. Well, I, I don't like to um, eat when I'm exercising um, very much. Like I don't really feel like eating mm -hmm. um, if I'm doing a hike. And, um, and when I get hungry in my sort of normal life, I don't, this doesn't happen to me, but if I'm exercising and I get to that point, I'll find that I, I do, I guess they call it bonking or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like I'll, I'll suddenly feel quite dizzy and, um, you know, like I just suddenly like, okay, I have to eat something. And I was just kind of curious, um, is there a way maybe before the hike to eat certain things that are going to allow me to expend a lot of energy before I have to eat again? Or is it just a discipline to sort of force yourself to eat when you don't even feel like eating it? You know? Yeah, no, that's a great question. That's, that's definitely a common problem. Um, in, so it, it can happen like um, in excessive heat that you lose your appetite or like at altitude, you might lose your appetite or just because your body is working hard and sort of like the cortisol release sort of suppresses your appetite. So um, I, that's a great question. And I would say, so there's a couple of things you could do. So something that I encourage when you lose your appetite on trail um, is consuming liquid calories if you can. So if you can get down liquid, so maybe making um, like a smoothie recipe, it's like a smoothie recipe of some sort. Your cat is so cute. Um, <laughs> um, so, or, so yeah, so something that has some fat and protein and a little bit of carb in it, but in a liquid version, because sometimes when you can't eat, you can still at least drink. If I don't know if that's yeah. the case for you, but that's something yeah. I like to do. Um, is find like a protein powder or maybe you could mix it in with some other things, whether that's, I mean, honestly, like a protein powder mixed in water, if you want to keep it really simple or something like one of those, um, like scratch labs or hammer nutrition or something like that has those packets that do have like carbohydrate and protein in them that you could drink. So sort of like summarize that idea of like drinking your calories, which at least is going to prevent you from bonking. Um, whether you want to make a recipe at home or find something that's like in a packet that you purchase. And then what you said about fueling beforehand, I think is really smart as well. And I would include as long as it was more than like an hour or two before you were working out or like before a hard hike, um, just so you're not having like stomach issues trying to digest a big meal, but I would have like a pretty solid meal, including um, fat, carb, and protein in it, because those are all going to like release at different times and keep your energy like steady over the course of a hike. So that at least it could like delay that feeling for a while. I find like, if I'm like, when I'm leaving town on a through hike, if I eat a pretty big meal, um, before I head out, I, I often don't need to eat for like several hours. So, okay, you know, great. Hopefully that great. helps. Thank yeah. you. Um, I had, I was also curious, like, so if you're doing a through hike and you have, so you, you have your meal plan, you know, your mm -hmm. spreadsheet, um, do you pack boxes with those bulk ingredients and then you could sort of construct those meals or do you pre-package all of that? I do all of that at home. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I'll have, I'll do it like assembly line style. And I try to like get some friends over and I'll like buy them pizza or something. I'm like, all right, everyone, <laughs> we're going to make 60 smoothies and we're going to make 60 like bean dinners. And so we'll just have our own measuring cups and we'll just like do it in bulk. And then I'll divide up my meals. Like, okay, I know that this section of trail is going to take me five days. So I'm putting five dinners and five breakfasts and five, whatever in here. And then and dividing it up like that. So I try to keep it as once I'm on trail as simple as possible because I know I'm just like too tired basically to do anything except put my shelter up and eat and then go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Let's see. Um can you speak more uh to what you eat the night before the morning of a big hike? Mm, yeah. Yes, I can. Um so I would say the night before, like, I don't think I would eat sufficiently, but I don't think you need to eat like there. I, I remember when I was growing up in like track and field and stuff, there was this whole idea of like carbo loading and we would go out for these like giant pasta dinners and then feel awful the next day. And like, which did not help our performance at all. So I don't think you need to like massively carbo load. I would eat sufficiently, 
Um, and yeah, don't restrict it if you're, unless you're keto and it's part of your diet, but I wouldn't like restrict carbohydrates. I would just eat them in a normal amount. So to summarize what I was just saying, eat a normal dinner the morning of, I would eat, um, like I would eat a, for me personally, what's coming to mind right now is like, and what I usually eat is like a piece of toast with a couple eggs, um, which is my protein. And then maybe some sort of uh, fat, which is probably the olive oil that I'm cooking in, in. And then I eat like greens on top of them and that protein with some carb from the toast. And then maybe like some cheese or dairy free cheese on there for me. Um, and that's enough because it has that, that protein, the fat and the carb in there. And that's going to last me again, several hours. And then I'll have maybe um, a builder cliff bar, for example, to have, because again, has like um, about equal protein and carb in it. And that'll be like my next snack that I'll have. Um, so you should eat whatever you like um, because you might not like eggs and toast and things like that. But what I would include is um, making sure that it has um, those, like the three macronutrients in it. If you're not about to do something really hard. If you're about to do like a really hard workout, like go for a run, I probably wouldn't eat things that are slow to digest like fat. I would keep it a little lighter and mostly eat carbohydrate and a little bit of protein. But if you're going to be moving at like a moderate pace, I don't, I think you should be able to like be fine eating stuff that um, is a little slower to digest. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. Um, let's see. We have one more question, I think here. Um, can you include your current body fat as part of your calculations? I'm not quite sure. Do you need a more explanation on that? Yeah, I'm not sure quite what they mean. Um, Leandro, why don't you just unmute yourself and just ask her that? Yeah. So when you're trying to calculate the amount of fat or carbohydrates that you want to pack, can mm -hmm. you also take into account that you might be carrying a little extra weight and mm -hmm. said, Hey, I, you know, I have five extra pounds of fat mm -hmm. and not pack those. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So instead of changing my, the macronutrients that I was eating, um, if you were wanting to, to see, yeah, this is a definitely a common question that I've heard of like, okay, I want to lose a bit, a little bit of weight. So I wouldn't think about changing your macronutrients. If anything, I would change your calories a little bit, but I would just caution you not to go too low, um, especially on a longer trip, because it can really have an effect on like your energy and um, even how clearly you can think. Um, and if it's a long trip, you know, being too low on calories too long can actually like affect your immune system as well. So I think going a little bit, maybe, I don't know, a couple hundred calories under what you need is totally fine. That's, you know, especially if it's a day hike, like your body can completely deal with that deficit. I would just be hesitant on like a multi-month trip to continue doing that over and over again. Um, like if you're cutting yourself short by like a thousand calories or something. So kind of to summarize what I was just saying, I wouldn't think about changing my macronutrients as much as I would think about changing my calories if I wanted to um, lose a little bit of weight, like a little bit of body fat. Is that helpful? Thank you. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions? No? Well, great. That was awesome. awesome. Oh, good. Well, thanks and everyone uh, for hanging out. <laughs> yeah, all those questions fun. are really interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, <laughs> you're getting a lot of uh, thank yous there. Oh, good. I have to read through this. Oh, thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> this was fun. Um.